in there. Okay, so welcome to week number four of Mini Med. As uh, you guys found out last week and the week before that, we are taking attendance via a survey. Um, Matt will put it into the chat once Dr. Patel starts talking, and that survey must be filled out by nine o'clock tonight um, in order to get credit for attending today's class. So week four, we have Dr. Vanessa Patel, who's going to be speaking on the topic of anxiety. And as all of our speakers are, she is going to also give you a little tidbit into her life and how she got to where she is and and what she enjoys doing about her job and all that kind of fun stuff. Um, so without further ado, let me introduce you to Dr. Vanessa Patel. She specializes in pain psychiatry at Christiana Care Behavioral Health and her care for patients at the Outpatient Comprehensive Pain Center includes chronic pain support group therapy, a program she established shortly after joining Christiana Care. Dr. Patel earned her medical degree at Medical University of the Americas and completed a psychiatry residency at Henry Ford Health System, Wayne State University. She is board certified in psychiatry by the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology. Dr. Patel participates in chronic pain research and quality improvement projects and has authored abstracts accepted for presentation. She is a member of the American Association of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, American Psychiatric Association, and is the top doctor in the global directory of who's who. Dr. Patel earned her medical degree at Medical University of the Americas and completed a psychiatric residency at Henry Ford Health System, Wayne State University. And without further ado, Dr. Patel, the floor is yours. All righty, thank you so much for that introduction. And I am going to make sure I try to get this right on the first shot. Um, All right, everyone can see that okay? Yes, we can. Great, wonderful. So I wanted to take a second to welcome everybody. Good evening. Um, and first of all, give you all a huge shout out because it has been a long day for most of you, I'm sure. And it does take a lot of energy and a lot of motivation and will to be here and join us for the session tonight. So uh, thank you guys for showing up. You know, that's half the battle and a lot of the things that we do. And I trust that you'll find a lot of what we talked about, talk about tonight um, valuable as you return back to your inevitable hustle and bustle of your day to day life, um, whether it be school, work, um, you know, future family careers. Uh, I feel like a lot of times we put ourselves at the bottom of the list of priorities when it comes to taking care of the things and the people that need to be taken care of. And I think that's a good point for me to stop and take a moment to introduce myself. Um, like Dr. Smith said, I am Dr. Vanessa Patel. I'm a board certified licensed psychiatrist serving the local Delaware community as well as surrounding states in New Jersey and Pennsylvania. Um, I started pursuing my career in medicine quite late compared to a lot of my colleagues who knew quite early on, you know, that they were interested in medicine you know, and started working towards that career, um, maybe in high school or even middle school. Um, I was always interested in learning about the mind and how it works because I was just so fascinated because like anatomically, if you don't preserve this organ with lots of chemicals, um, it's pretty much just mush, you know, yet it has so much power, you know, so much ability to control our thoughts, our movements, and ultimately our future. So I was always quite interested in learning about how it works. And um, I was, you know, timid, uh, first generation born Indian American girl in North Jersey, um, stayed pretty close to my parents and close to home for undergrad, um, chose to go to TCNJ, which is right outside of Trenton, New Jersey. Um, to complete a bachelor's in psychology. And then while I was doing a lot of my required classes for my psychology major, I was interested in, a, I found myself interested in a lot of the biopsychology classes. I feel like I started getting a lot of answers to that curiosity that I had about the brain of ours, you know, this mush and how it works. I started kind of understanding what happens at a molecular level, started dissecting the circuitry and the neuronal pathways that, again, have so much impact in our day to day. And eventually find myself wanting to learn how the mind and the body work in conjunction because they inevitably do, even though a lot of times we try to separate it so much. Um, so, of course, this kind of led me to start working towards this career in medicine. But like I said, I was late in making that decision. So I wasn't the strongest of applicants compared to my colleagues who were preparing for this 
a good like half a decade um, before me. But I think um, when you have a passion and you have a vision, it's like you will find a way to get there. And that's kind of what I felt like psychiatry was a calling. I wanted to um, help individuals learn things from a young age and how to figure out how to better navigate their emotions because, you know, we all experience them inevitably. And we're going to learn. All right. So um, you see in the bottom. Pat, left, Tim, you're be not on mute. Tim, microphone Tim. And be an up arrow. Tim, you're not and on mute. Click that and make sure that the speakers <laughs> on, you are the speakers you normally use. Tim, Tim Gibbs, you're not on mute, my friend. Well, just switch. All right, it to hang on. Let me see if I can mute him. There you go. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry um, about that. <laughs> no, no worries at all. Um, so I ended up taking a detour. I went to a school, me, who was born and raised in Jersey, very close to home, a school that was 1,600 miles away um, in a small island called Nevis in, West, in the West Indies, and I completed my first two years of medical school there um, at the Uni Medical University of the Americas. Afterwards, I did two years of clinical rotations in various cities all over the United States, you know, Southside Chicago, Shreveport, Louisiana, Taos, Towson, Maryland, Brooklyn, New York, and my goodness, it was such an enriching experience, you know, different populations, different societies, cultures, and just such a wide um, array of medical cases that I was exposed to. And along the way, not only did I learn all the medicine that I learned, but I also learned, gained a lot of knowledge and understanding of me and who I am. And um, I feel like I give a lot of credit to that journey into, you know, leading me to who I've become over the years. Um, I, along, at, along the way, somehow, what, at one point got married. I completed my residency at Henry Ford in Detroit, Michigan. And we had our two boys who are now four and five. And we were like, you know what? We want to move closer back to family uh, near grandparents and cousins and all that. So that's what brought my family back to the East Coast. Um, and currently now we're working at Christiana. Or I'm working at Christiana. I'm coming close in on my fifth year almost. Um, I work with such a wonderful team, and it's been quite an honor to serve the community here in Delaware for, with their mental health needs now more than ever, because I think the pandemic was a reminder for everyone globally that, you know, anxiety is real um, and it's okay to talk about it. And I think on that note, I, we could probably start talking about it today. <laughs> um, so I'm hoping that by the end of today's session, you gain a better understanding of what is anxiety and the different types of anxiety, what is normal, what requires a little bit more attention, and most importantly, what you can do to help manage it day to day. So we're going to take a second, and I know you guys all have access to the chat, um, and you could unmute yourselves too if you feel better doing that, but what is anxiety. What words would you use to describe anxiety? And you could feel free to drop some in here. Or you could feel free to unmute yourself and shout them out because I don't think I could see everybody. Flight or fight, stress, paranoid, scared, ooh, panic, anxious, chaos, overwhelms, nervous. Great, great words, all of these. Thank you so much for participating. terrified, dread. I think those were some of the later ones I saw. So here is a, not a collective, like a wholesome list, but you know, lots of the words that you guys have described, the, the worried, fearful, nervous, hesitant, panicky, overwhelmed, all great words to capture what we all have inevitably felt at some point in our lives. I wouldn't be surprised if you experienced some of that just earlier today, you know, in our regular day to day when we're facing different stressors. So given that this is the later part of the evening, I do want to take uh, another second or two to step away from this PowerPoint and take about a minute, that's right, just 60 seconds to just take a breather. And we'll take a few moments to calm your mind and body. Soften your face, your neck, 
and shoulders. Do your best to fully let go. And turn your attention to the breath, the calming breath, the soothing breath. Take long, slow breaths, full and deep. Breathing in, I am calm. Breathing out, I'm at peace. All right. Thank you guys so much. Hopping right back to where we were. Again, just 60 seconds. I think all of us maybe can safely say that we do feel a little bit less stressed or a little bit more calm than we did about 60 seconds ago. And it is just that simple, just one minute that you could plug in multiple times throughout your day to just take a breather and to reset. Um, and we're going to learn lots more skills later today, but I just wanted to make sure we started off the session right and be given up everyone an opportunity to relax ourselves a bit. So... Now we could go into our more formal definition of anxiety, which is a feeling of unease. Um, so that we have this fear or this worry that you guys have mentioned in a range of other um, words that can go from mild, moderate to severe. And we all feel anxious at some points. Anxiety, feeling anxious is normal. And for a lot of us, a lot of times it can also be helpful. Um, you know, it helps us become more alert and focused at tasks that are at hand. So for example, when studying for an exam, you know, when we feel those pre-exam nerves, you know, weeks before, days before the exam, it is a, it has a positive effect. It motivates us like, hey, pay attention. You got this huge thing coming up. You need to focus on this and you'll get, you know, fo focus your thoughts on this task that enhance so you could study and perform well. Um, a lot of times anxiety can also lead to, uh, highly intelligent out, um, outcomes with research and um, being good analyzers. You know, they are often good critical thinkers. And a lot of times when you are feeling anxious and you are a good critical thinker, you're going to research a lot. And that's kind of what might have brought a lot of you here to learn about anxiety. The more you learn about something, the more you could do something about it. And the more you learn to do something about it, the more you become a problem solver on how to navigate your day, despite of these peaks of anxiety that you might express experience with your day-to-day -day stressors and channeling it in a positive way. Anxiety is also rooted in our need to protect ourselves. And I think that was the pandemic that we saw, right? Um, we knew that there's this lethal virus out there. It brought attention and focus to like, hey, you know, this is okay to feel a little bit on edge because it requires you to make sure that when you leave your house, you're masking up. When you are moving from person to person or you're going to be around, you know, different environments that you're washing your hands in between different, you know, um, people that you're meeting. So, again, a positive thing that came out of this anxiety, this feeling of unease, knowing that there is something dangerous around us that is appropriate for us to respond in that way. It is when it becomes too much that it becomes a problem. And I think that goes to say for a lot of things, right? Too much of anything can become problematic. So when we're in this constant state of anxiety, it becomes unhealthy and detrimental to our lives and our relationships. It leads to this condition where we start experiencing these conditions where we start experiencing distress and, and agitation. Um, a lot of times anxiety is internal. You know, our body experiences this unease and it has this constant like vague, um, like response to this unrecognized danger. And more often than not, that worry or unease is typically to a hypothetical event or a like uncertain outcome. And we're so focused on those probabilities, like the hundreds of probabilities that can actually happen, but not really focused on what is actually happening or what has more realistic probability of happening. So I'm gonna take a moment to kind of compare anxiety to some of the words that you guys were throwing out earlier. Anxiety versus fear, you know? Very similar in what we see as a response, but very different in what actually triggers it. So fear is that fight or flight response I think someone mentioned in, in the chat. That could save your life, li lives, right? Like you have a tiger running at you and you, know, you get that adrenaline run, rush going to either fight this tiger or run away. 
ends up saving your life. It's great. But without an actual danger being present, your thoughts end up taking that place of that danger, that so-called danger. And then your mind and your body perceive it as if it is like this tiger running at you and you go into this high gear fight or fight response. And I don't know about you, but that sounds exhausting to be walking around like that all the time when there's no actual danger that's present. So again, this is all about that fine tuning and balance. So there's Erks and Dodson here that had, you know, shared this bell curve with us in the early 1900s about anxiety and finding that right balance. You know, having too little of anything, especially anxiety, can also become a problem. Like for that simple example about taking an exam that we talked about, you know, if you're not if your anxiety doesn't kick in enough to be nervous about it, to send, you know, spend those hours studying and focusing and taking notes and reading and doing whatever you need to do, you're going to pro perform poorly on that exam. And then, of course, you know, as your anxiety increases and you divert the attention to the task at hand, you start having this optimal performance with your exam. But if it gets too high, you know, it gets to a point where you're not able to focus, you know, concentration becomes compromised, you're not able to sleep, so now you're sleep deprived, you know, you're not able to relax your brain and your body enough to actually dive into what you got to study to then eventually perform well in your exam and nothing actually registers to for you to perform well in that exam. So again, that fine tuning that balance um, it's explained by this curve here. I'm going to take it one more step with stress versus anxiety. I think stress was another word that a lot of you guys had thrown out there in the chat. Um, again, very similar. We get the same responses, but the actual thing that's causing that stress, that insult or injury, whatever it might be, it has passed, but yet your anxiety is still lingering or it hasn't even occurred. And you're just living in this future possibility of like, what if this? What if that? What could happen? What might happen instead of actually focusing on what is happening? And again, I'm going to just step away from the PowerPoint for just another minute really quickly because I know I'm explaining it, but I think this video does a really good job kind of showing you that it's so slight the difference, but so um, great in how, mu how much it could affect you. This is Stephanie and Juliet. Stephanie is feeling nervous because she has a huge deadline tomorrow. Stephanie is stressed. Juliet is feeling nervous for an unknown reason. Juliet has anxiety. Stephanie goes over her annual budget. It's extremely stressful. Juliet finally has a moment to herself. She still feels anxious. Stephanie has a conversation with Juliet. She enjoys the conversation. Juliet has a conversation with Stephanie. She feels uncomfortable and will later overanalyze everything she said. Stephanie decides to take a break and have lunch. She feels recharged. Juliet decides to take a break and have lunch. She still feels anxious. Stephanie sleeps after a long day at work. She's happy to finally put the day behind her. Juliet can't sleep. She goes over her schedule for tomorrow over and over again. Yes, stress can be difficult, but it's not the same as having an anxiety disorder. When someone opens up about their anxiety, don't respond with, I've been stressed too. Listen. All righties, and I promise you those are the last of the videos. Um, but why does all this happen? The stress, this anxiety that we're feeling, um, where is it all coming from? What's happening at a molecular level in our brains? So when we normally visualize a a threat, you know, that bear, that lion, the tiger, it sends these signals to your prefrontal cortex, which um, gets you into the gear to physically run away or fight, and your amygdala, which is triggering the um, stress and uh, fear response. This adrenaline that is rushed into our bloodstream enables us to do that running away or that fighting. This happens whether this danger is real or whether you believe the danger is there when actually there could be no none. Um, this is the body's alarm system and it's a survival mechanism, right? So primitive mankind wouldn't have survived for as long as we've survived if we didn't have this life-saving response. It works so well that it often um, kicks in when it's not supposed to. And then we end up with this danger that's in our head rather than what's happening in reality. Um, a lot of times we just have this respond and you're like, go, go, go. And it's hard for you to hit the brakes because you've kind of already 
in this response where you don't have think times to um, take take that pause to res before you respond. And um, for individuals who struggle with anxiety, a lot of times they are in this constant scanning mode. So if you're you know walking down the street and you're looking for things that are possible danger, you know those low probabilities that can possibly lead to something dangerous you're gonna find some probability is that you will find something that could possibly be dangerous. And now you're like walking around this high sense of hyperactive mode. And when you've been doing this for years, because very often than not, it does start in childhood. And we're gonna go into that in a little bit detail too. Um, your body kind of just gets used to it. Your mind gets used to it. Um, it doesn't have that triaging system anymore. You know, um, I know we're all guilty of, you know, um, like, looking back at a situation where it's like, oh man, I shouldn't have reacted to that, you know, with that huge ball of emotion for that little incident. But it's like when you're already on high alert and something small happens, it just rushes, you know? Um, imagine if you're calling, like if there is an actual dangerous situation and you call 911 for help, it's imagine if the person on the receiving end is like not asking you like, hey, do you need an ambulance? Do you need a, a fire truck? Or do you need a, a police car? Like what's this, what's the emergency? You know, usually they say 911, what's your emergency? There's no asking that. This is like, you call 911, here's all floodgates coming at you, you know, whatever, whatever you need, but it's too much and it's exhausting emotionally and physically. Um, a lot of times when individuals are growing up in stressful environments, um, whether it be like the family, schools, neighborhoods, it can contribute to this anxiety and how you become wired like this from a young age to have this hyper arousal response. Um, a lot of times family history of anxiety contributes to this. So mom, dad, siblings, grandparents who are of high anxiety, you would see this in, in kids and generations to come. Um, anxious parents um, can model anxious behaviors. So that's why it's also really important to kind of work on coping skills together. Um, and it becomes kind of like a family thing. You know, it, it, it encourages kids to open up and talk about their anxiety um, and parents to, to also like normalize it in, in the household. And that way you could learn from each other and work on these tools together. So you don't feel isolated when you're trying to conquer this anxiety. Um, Individuals who have faced a lot of trauma growing up, again, their brain gets trained to be this high alert mode. So a lot of times um, when, what we, when we talk about treatment, and we'll get to that a bit later too, is a lot of rewiring of this circuitry that we're seeing here. You know, how do we hit the brakes? How do we think, start thinking a little bit differently so we don't get these um, fires going out every couple of minutes, even, even when nothing is actually dangerous that's happening around us. And that's why it's so important um, to focus in our childhood years because that's when a lot of our nervous system is developing. And it's not unusual to see children who live lives with so with a, in a high levels of stress developing anxiety disorders going into their adolescence and um, into adulthood. So um, now that we kind of understand what's happening when it comes to anxiety, I wanted to take an opportunity to kind of start diving into the different types of anxiety. And I'm sure you might have heard about a lot of these. Um, I'm here to tell you a lot of these are diagnoses and they're ways of communicating, you know, physician to physician, physician to therapist, therapist to patient, patient to therapist, uh, physician. You know, it, it, it does, I don't want you to walk away today with like hyper fixating on anything, um, trying to like self-diagnose or anything like that, because I think what we, we do want to focus on is how we're feeling. And regardless of what you call it in this list of um, disorders, all anxiety is an overestimate of danger and an underestimate of your ability to cope. And this combination is what leads to these interruptions in our day-to-day -day functionality. And that is a key component that we see when things are being diagnosed with things. It is that it's interrupting with your day-to-day -day functionality. Um, these, there's barriers in our functionality with these fears, what, um, our sense of perceived danger, our discomfort, our nervousness. You know, We wanna keep in mind all of this stuff later when we're talking about treatment and goals because a lot of this is undoing exactly that, you know, increasing our ability to cope and decreasing that, you know, that um, in, innate response of like scanning for danger and ultimately improving our day-to-day -day functionality, both emotionally as well as physically. And then 
I know I listed a bunch of disorders here. I'm going to focus in on the first five. I included um, OCD and trauma-related anxiety disorders, which include like PTSD and acute stress disorder for completeness sakes, but they alone individually would each need another whole lecture time. So I just wanted to make sure I included it here just for completeness sake. So we could start with generalized anxiety disorder. It's the most common type of anxiety disorder. In the, some of the main symptoms that we see with generalized anxiety disorder is that you're constantly worrying about different activities and events. Um, you're very often feeling like you're not in control and you feel like this constant like on edge with all of your surroundings. Um, generalized anxiety disorder is very hard. It's, it's difficult to diagnose because you'll see compared to other anxiety disorders, it doesn't have very specific, unique symptoms um, for that type of specific anxiety. If anything, it's like this vague restlessness, um, poor, like poor concentration, easily tiring, uh, irritability, muscle tension, sleep disturbances. You know, you're, it's like you're trying to go to sleep. I think we saw in that video, um, but your mind is just like not able to shut down. It's like this hamster wheel that keeps going and going and worrying about the 50 different things on your mind. So. A lot of this, when you're experiencing it chronically um, in an excessive amount for at least six months, it gets diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder. For children, it's, it's 12 months. Um, and more often than not, it does begin in early childhood and adolescent years. I feel like a lot of times when patients come for the very first time experiencing or endorsing these um, symptoms and you ask like, well, when did it first start? And they're like, oh, I'm, I think I've kind of been like this my entire life. And it, you know, dates back into their childhood. And we all have common worries. You know, we're worried about relations, our health, our finances, you know, our grades, our career, you know, our daily day-to-day -day, um, stressors. But it's gotten so bad that it's interrupting our functionality. You know, it's, it's getting to a point where like, yes, I'm stressed about, um, you know, my finances, but I, I can't even get myself to get out there and get a job to fix those financial stressors, you know, um, it becomes a point to where you start avoiding situations, you know, you, you'd rather not deal with the negative consequences that would occur, you end up spending a lot of time preparing for every possible thing that could go wrong, when reality, not everything is going to go wrong. And now you've just wasted all this time, it's interrupting that day to day time that you have. Um, you end up procrastinating because again, you're so worried about the outcome that you're just not even going to tackle the problem. Um, you have a hard time making a decision because you're so worried that if you make the wrong one, you might end up in another hole that you didn't want to go in. And I mean, when you're thinking that negative, you're going to keep thinking about all the possible negative holes that you're going to fall into instead of thinking like, hey, if it works out, it might just be okay. Um, and a lot of times you, fi uh, you find uh, yourself looking for reassurance from your loved ones, your, your colleagues, your peers, like, hey, like, is this okay? Like, I, they kind of need that stamp of approval because their anxiety is keeping them to a point where they're not able to do this independently and confidently. All right, so I'm gonna move on to social anxiety disorder, a little bit more specific, a little less generalized in that it is also known as social phobia at one point. Um, it's basically when you're having a lot of worry about social situations meeting people for the first time, going um, to new places for the first time, you know, getting on a stage to perform for the first time. And again, I think we could all safely say that we all experience some nerves before any of these events. You know, I'm guilty of that too, uh, before tonight even. But it is that it is the, into the fear is so intense, so much so that either it could happen before, during, or after the event. Um, and it's gotten to a point where you feel like you're going to do something or say something so embarrassing that you end up avoiding the situation entirely. So you don't even put yourself out there or you kind of power through the situation. And then at one point realize you got to drop it. And that's when that social phobia kicks in in the middle of the event or even afterwards, like you survived the whole event. But then it's like your mind is just like replaying every conversation you had in that event and everything that you could have said differently or like, how could I have said that? That sounds so silly. Like, you know, it, it's just, again, interrupting your day to day. Um, and this disruption, you know, can have a domino effect, you know, especially in kids like your social life. It's such a crucial part of your learning about yourself and understanding who you are in the society, you know that social emotional learning has been so huge and focused on 
And if you're not able to get out in a social situation, it's like a whole part of you just almost doesn't develop that way. Um, going into adulthood, you know, like I said earlier, like not even getting to that job interview because you're so fearful about getting in front of somebody that you end up just kind of digging yourself deeper with those financial struggles, or, you know, you're not able to go out and meet people or not able to go out on a date um, and talk about it, um, like your nervousness, and then you find yourself just being isolated because you're just avoiding it. Um, and this avoidance uh, is is uh, quite a bit into a point where even with uh, you're experiencing this isolation or this uh, social phobia symptoms for at least six months, yes, you get diagnosed with social phobia or social anxiety, but around 33% of those individuals actually end up meeting criteria for avoidant personality disorder because of how much they end up avoiding these situations entirely. So things to be mindful of. Um, moving on, we have specific phobias. Again, um, very specific, overwhelming, I'm sorry, overwhelming fears to very specific objects, places, um, situations, feelings, or things. Um, there's, they're stronger than a normal fear. Like I also don't want spiders crawling on me, but I feel like I will react to it a bit differently. Um, and it wouldn't be interrupting my day to day so much where I am, um, you know, avoiding the situation completely. Like, for example, I think we see here blood injection injuries. Like, so if you had to get blood work done because of a medical condition that you had, you know, you'd rather almost not get the blood work done and risk that medical condition just getting worse or not knowing where it's standing. That would be interrupting your day-to-day -day quality of life. You know, same thing with like getting on bridges and things like that, where, you know, thousands and hundreds and thousands of people go on bridges every single day, but you're worried the one time that you're going to go on a bridge, that's when it's going to collapse so much so that you will not visit New York City at all because you're afraid to get into onto a bridge or in going through a tunnel. And there are people that have just not left New York City, actually, if they were born and raised on the island, have not actually left the island because there's no other way to leave the island if you're not going to use a tunnel or a bridge. So again, it in like that interruption to your day to day, I'm breaking some barriers, uh, causing some barriers to what you would want to do if you could. And a lot of times these uh, phobias present in clusters. So it's very often that if you have a phobia for one thing, um, you, you might find some uh, phobias for some other specific objects here. Uh, also runs in the family. So mom and dad that has a specific phobia for something, very likely that the child will have a similar or specific phobia. All right. Then we have panic disorder. Um, Sometimes when anxiety gets so high, it drives people into a panic. It, it, it the 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 feeling, the intense, overwhelming fear is so strong that you have this feeling of impending doom. There's shortness of breath, chest pain, sweaty palms. Um, often feel like you're having a heart attack so much so that people will go to the emergency room complaining that they're having a heart attack, but you know find that their heart is completely fine and it was actually a panic attack. Um, when these panic attacks are ha happening frequently enough, um, you start worrying about when that next one's going to come or the one after that or the one after that. And then that becomes your anxiety. Like you're constantly worried that you're going to have another panic attack. And that's what leads to the panic disorder. Um, I've, I have listed many things, you know, um, that people can experience panic attacks with, like what, uh, like the symptoms that they can experience it with, but they could also have, um, depersonalization or derealization, you know, kind of those like out of body experiences during that time or not feeling grounded to reality. Again, these would kind of require more um, interventions, whether it would be with treatment and therapy. Um, you might find that there are situations that you were in that have, you have experienced this that have been untriggered. You know, that's another key component when it comes to panic disorder. When these panics attacks are coming on because they're specifically triggered by a specific situation, we're leaning more towards that specific phobia of some sort. If it's coming on untriggered, we're leaning towards more of that panic disorder. Um, and it's also important to note that, you know, 25% of individuals will experience single panic attacks in their life. You know, it doesn't mean that they're going to meet criteria for panic disorder. It's that, that new sort of anxiety, that worry that kicks in about like that next panic attack coming on. Um, where am I going to be when it happens? Will I be able to escape when it happens? And that's kind of what leads us to 
agoraphobia um, comes from the Greek word agora or marketplace. Um, basically, this is, again, a disproportionate marked amount of fear and anxiety. Um, sounds very similar to everything else we've talked about today so far, but happening in um, multiple situations where you feel like there's a diff uh, there might be some difficulty escaping um, or receiving help in an event that you are stuck in any way, you know, have these, and you end up having these panic-like symptoms. And it could be, you know, simple things about like just being outside of your home alone, you know, physically just stepping outside of your house alone, traveling in uh, pu uh, public transportation, um, open, like being in open spaces that are kind of just like these vast, like open parking lots or crowded spaces like um, the mall or the th movie theaters. Um, standing in line sometimes can cause these panic attacks to come on. Um, basically, any of these situations can provoke this fear, this anxiety that you're not going to be able to escape if something were to go wrong. And it goes on for about six months, just like a lot of our other disorders. And um, it's it, it gets to a point where like sometimes people will end up enduring it and then we'll never do it again or they need someone to like be with them like kind of as a companion to be in these spaces and then that becomes their their crutch and we're going to talk about safety behaviors in a little bit but a lot of times um a lot of this avoidance adds to that uh, possibility of avoidant disorder as well all right. So I know now I've gone through like some formal definitions of like diagnoses and like reviewing some of them. I wanted to just share some facts. I know a lot of there's a lot of kids here. So um, at least 20 percent of children under the age of 18 have significant mental health problems and about 75 percent of those don't get the help that they need. And oftentimes and not when this is starting in childhood, it persists into adulthood by the time they get that help for the first time. And it's like we were trying to like um, undo anxiety that we've kind of um, solidified for so many years because we didn't interrupt it at a sooner age. So, you know, early intervention for prevention is the way to go. Um, up to 6% of kids and youth have anxiety disorders severe enough to need treatment. Um, many children have more than one kind of anxiety disorder. So sometimes if they are diagnosed with an anxiety disorder, about 50% of them meet criteria for another anxiety disorder, and 75% of those individuals will meet criteria for another psychological disorder in general. I also wanted to add to this that is very often um, presented presents with other uh, psychological dis uh, disorders such as depression, substance abuse, um, personality disorders, and even uh, medical disorders, you know, cor cor coronary artery disease, very high in individuals who struggle with anxiety, often when it has gone untreated for so many years. Um, other stats to throw out here, women in general, um, we find twice as more likely than men to have an anxiety disorder. There are a lot of theories around this because women are more likely to report these symptoms where men are trying to, you know, being encouraged to just face their fears. Um, also, women are more likely to experience childhood uh, sexual abuse, and that leads to a lot of the trauma-related anxiety disorders. And then also, in general, women are more have more biological stress re reactivity compared to men. There's also a lot of cultural factors to take into consideration. I know there's a lot of studies done about different cultures shaping their anxieties and fears and what's appropriate and things have been stigmatized over the years. Um, there's a lot of studies with Japanese cultures and sea, seal hunters. And um, I think it's just important to make note of that regardless of the, how it varies in different cultures, the, the somatic and psychological presentation of these disorders is very similar. Um, it's just a matter of actually identifying it and giving the opportunity to actually talk about it. So anxiety um, affects us in many ways, behaviorally, physiologically, emotionally, our thoughts. And so I'm going to kind of break it up a little bit and the different things that we would see and collectively um, what would require attention. Um, so when we notice behaviors like avoiding people in places, pe pe people are like not going out as much anymore, um, or they're only going to certain places at a certain time, for example, you know, choosing to go to smaller shops because they're overwhelmed with going to bigger marketplaces or only going at a time when there's not a lot of people around in those, like, you know, going 
grocery shopping at seven o'clock in the morning, something like that, or uh, um, only going with someone else and then having like this quick escape of uh, or like this uh, habit of leaving early. There's also uh, some adaptable behaviors. We call them like safety behaviors because you've, you're so feared to go into these situations that you, you you develop coping skills because you can't really avoid them forever unless you really just don't interact with anybody. And a lot of times there is this desire of wanting to be in social situations or go out and talk to people, but it's it, um, you feel like there's this barrier because of this anxiety. So they start you know smoking more or holding a drink actually drinking, um, fiddling with their clothes and their hands. Um, and this is when other safety, other, other, um, skills can come into place, but also, um, take a, taking a medication before going. So not always unhealthy, but things to be mindful of that could possibly be unhealthy and lead down to, um, not making eye contact and having these escape plans in mind. And, really being focused so much on that, that they're not actually present with the conversation that they're trying to have with somebody in a social setting, for example. A lot of times like these safety behaviors can help keep your anxiety going. Um, the key, the, the thing to understand there is that because you do the safety behavior, you kind of tell your brain that like, hey, things worked out okay because I engaged in like drinking or I had the smoke with so-and-so or this person was with me. And now this becomes your crutch and you feel like you can't do it without this um, factor. And um, a lot of times it fuels our anxiety a little bit more. So it's important to try to challenge it without some of these safety behaviors so that you could learn that like, hey, I did it. I didn't use a safety behavior. That means I'm capable of doing it again. Nothing bad happened. Um, but like I said, a lot of this is internal. So I really like this cartoon that I'm sharing here about what others see when you feel fine, what others see when you feel anxious and what you think others see when you feel anxious, because a lot of times we feel like all eyes are on us. Um, there's actually a really great book that was released recently called the good awkward. And it talks about just the awkwardness of conversations and being out in situations where you might have to um, fear about what you would say or ask for something, whether it be like a raise or a promotion of some sort. And um, I, I really like how this relates to that because we have to really embrace the awkward a little bit um, because not all is on us. We are not looking like that to anybody except ourselves. And I feel like sometimes we become our own worst enemies when it comes to our anxiety. So I know there's different types of learners in the crowd. So I try to use words as well as visuals. Um, this is one that captures a lot of our physiological um, somatic symptoms that we could experience when we're feeling anxiety. And we've talked about, you know, your brain feeling like it's hijacked by these thoughts that are like race, 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 hamster wheel, you know, dry mouth, dizziness, heart racing, chest coming in tight, heart beating, sweat, sweaty palms, stomach churning. Um, a lot of times we do feel this queasiness or nausea in our gut when we're feeling anxious, because like I mentioned earlier, the mind and the body do work in conjunction. Um, so much so that we say the gut is your second brain. So happy gut, gut means a happy brain. So definitely treat yourself as well to a happy, healthy diet in general. Um, but, you know, in addition to that, at a molecular level, we actually do know that some of the little receptors in our gut are the same to that is on, in our brain, because when we take a medication to help with anxiety, some of the side effects we experience are in our gut because the medication doesn't know if it should be attacking our brain or our gut. And that's when we get that GI upset or some sort of um, queasiness when we start a new medication to help with anxiety. All right. Um, and then, so we talked about our behaviors. We talked about our physical symptoms and these are our thoughts, you know, they have a lot of power. They're, the, you know, they, they, they get the same response as if we were to be actually faced by danger, you know, in the woods with a bear or a lion. And so these are all the what ifs, the, all the possibilities, you know, what if she says no, what if she gets lost, you know, what if she doesn't like it, what if I fall, what if I stumble on my words, you know, living in this what if future state, um, and all the millions of possibilities, you know, I really like this presentation, because you're worrying about all of this. These are the things that can possibly happen. But then there's like that little speck of what's actually going to happen. Um, and you just wasted all this time and energy on this. 
All right, so a lot of this works in this vicious cycle. So I wanted to kind of bring it all together. Um, it all interacts with one another. It all impacts one another, your thoughts, your feelings, your behaviors. And people who struggle with anxiety often find themselves like just stuck in this, you know, like you want to escape, but I feel like if you don't reach out for help, it's really hard for you to escape because you've kind of been hardwired to do like respond to certain situations like this. And we do need to start challenging in different ways. Um, you know, you're underperforming, you're worrying, you're dreading, you're, it, it's all taking a toll on your physical health, your mental health. And, um, you know, again, coming down to like the, that I won't be able to cope is our biggest challenge, right? We feel like we can't do it. But once you seek help or start believing that you can do it, I will pretty much guarantee that you will start seeing change in that um, you won't be responding to that anxiety as much. Um, I'm going to just move ahead to a slide where we start identifying what considers what, what we would want to consider when we would want to consider getting help. When you have kids who are starting to avoid school, they're complaining of that stomach ache or the headache every morning before going to school. They're starting to avoid extracurricular activities or you're not engaging in your recreational activities. You know, if you're meeting up with your buddies on the weekend to play volleyball or something, you're just like, eh, I'm going to pass on it now. Um, easily upset about situations, you know, like, you, you, you know, you ask your kid like, hey, how is school? Or like, what do you want for dinner? And you get like this short snappy remark as if like, how dare you ask me that question? You know, when you're noticing that irritability, um, something to kind of be mindful of and figuring out like where it's, where it's actually stemming from because we know it's really not that question that's that triggering. Um, if parents and teachers have noted that a lot of time needs to go into comforting the child, um, or if there's having actual meltdowns or temper tantrums and things like that in the actual school where they have to, you know, it's disrupting the, the workflow of this of the school as well. Um, again, having this coming on abruptly and without any sort of explanation would require conversation. And I think it's great to maybe have these conversations on a regular basis, either before going to bed or at the dinner table. Um, and sharing your own as adults with the kids, you know, encouraging them that this is like an open platform, it's a safe space, you know, make it into a game of some sort. Um, I do one before I go to sleep with my kids who are three, who are four and five, where it's like, what was your favorite part of the day? And what was your not favorite part of the day? And if there's such vague questions, it's not like asking about how they're feeling or anything like that specifically, but it will trigger something that um, might have rubbed them the wrong way earlier that day. And they, I, one of them I actually ended up sharing with me that someone didn't let them play because of a reason that we would categorize as bullying. Um, but another one that you could do is, you know, what's something good that happened today? What's something bad that happened today? Um, what's something that you want to work on, you know, especially with the older kids, because they're always working and working towards accomplishing something, you know, when it comes to their applications for college or um, studying for that test or, you know, trying to honor roll and, you know, or whatever it might be, it's because that can all, all those things that they're working towards can be stressful and anxiety provoking. So we want to kind of catch it before it gets to a point where it, um, that anxiety has gotten so bad that they're not performing to their ability. All right. So when it comes to seeking help, there are a number of professional ways to um, find that support. A, a, you know, in college, there's a lot of um, student counseling services that are embedded in the campuses. When in workplaces, they have a lot of employee assistance programs, the EAPs um, for mental health. In general, when in doubt, a primary care provider is the best place to start because they will be able to connect you to the right person if they feel like you need to go to the, a psychiatrist or a therapist. Um, you could call any one of the following numbers. Of course, if your anxiety, depression, or any sort of mental state has gotten so bad where you're having thoughts about hurting yourself or hurting anyone else, you should definitely go to the emergency room or call 911. Um, we have mobile crisis centers that are unique in our local area for both Wilmington and um, Christiana, like through both the hospital systems um, or locations where they will actually figure out, a, like get on the phone with you and have a conversation, but they will also make plan to meet up with you, whether it's like at the hospital or the library or any sort of like meeting place. It, it could even be your house. 
And then once you're on their radar, they'll kind of come check up on you at the 24 hour or the 40 hour mark if they feel like it's appropriate or necessary. Um, you know, a lot of this, the suicide prevention um, lifeline is a 24 hour speak to me, you know, someone was going to be there to kind of walk you through the reasoning towards this life worth living. Um, because suicide is often a permanent solution to what is likely a temporary problem. And I think sometimes when you're in that crisis situation, you do just need that listening ear to kind of help you walk you through, identify um, some of your strengths, and then build from those, and then get you to in front of the right people if, again, necessary. You could definitely find a lot more information around this on the medlineplus.gov website. Um, and just recognize that asking for help is not a sign of weakness, but actually a sign of strength that you want to take control, you want to be back in the driver's seat and do something about this because you are more than that. You know, we are all more than our weakest points. Um, and then the best part is if you do reach out for help, there's plenty of help available. It, anxiety disorders can be treated. Um, you know, a lot of it, um, starts off with cognitive behavioral therapy, again, challenging those negative thoughts um, that are actually kind of just reacting to possible dangers and possibilities of worries and things like that that are not actually there. Um, increasing, it, it also helps you kind of work on increasing your ability to tolerate these uncertainties when you're kind of going to be in a situation where you're not really sure how everything's going to go. Like, even like a family vacation where you're not sure if the flight's going to get there on time or if your luggage is going to come in, that sort of anxiety can keep you from not going on the flight completely or going on the vacation overall. But again, kind of getting you like the cognitive behavioral therapy gets you to start, start tolerating these uncertainties a little bit more. Um, it kind of, they kind of start working with you where you could make times, schedule times to worry about things. And then when you're not in those windows, you're not going to be thinking about it and really like practicing that. Um, you learn to focus on the present moment. So again, not living in the future with the millions of possibilities, but really just focusing on today at this moment with mindfulness. Um, you could also do very structured systemic exposure things to like the specific phobias, the social phobias, agoraphobias, where you're kind of doing a guided graded approach so you're kind of working with going outside of the house to your front desk uh, for your front step and then kind of going to the end of the driveway then going to the end of the road and then outside of the neighborhood and kind of working your way up um, and I know that's a very simple example but just kind of give you the idea of how it would work there's a lot of um, social skills training to kind of decrease some of those safety behaviors that we talked about learning other relaxation and stress management tools and of course um, Eventually, you know, if there's a, a, a place for it, there are medications. Um, antidepressants serve the purpose to help with anti-anxiety, uh, anti-anxiolytics as well. Um, and then other ones that can be used off-label, which you could definitely have a more in-depth conversation with your provider about. I like this quote by another physician who shared that I always point out that the need for that there's a need more than medication, which is the bridge between feeling terrible to feeling better, but you still need to walk across that bridge. And that's where psychotherapy comes into play. So, you know, you could be on the best of medications, but if your tools on how to handle crisis situations or the high peaks of anxiety um, are not there, you're still going to keep finding yourself stumbling. And with that, I will like to share with you some skills that you could walk away with from today and hopefully find some benefit from. Um, and again, there's hundreds and hundreds of tools out there. So these are just a few that I wanted to capture today. Um, remembering that, you know, there's varying degrees to all of these. And, it, you know, just because it works for one person in one situation doesn't mean it's going to work for another person or even the same person in a different situation. So the more tools you have in the toolbox, the better you could manage the different types of situations you'll be facing. So I think um, even individuals who don't struggle with an anxiety disorder, you know, this we all know and have, ex have can safely say we've experienced stress. So skills are always helpful for all of us to learn. Um, skills have no side effects. So for me, it's all benefits and no negatives. Um, so we're gonna start off by first uh, challenging or unhelpful thinking. So we, we're all prone to distorted thinking at time. You know, it could be 
very catastrophic. We could start labeling ourselves. We could putting ourselves at fault. We're like having exaggerated um, automatic responses. And the first step to all of this is to identifying it, noticing it, like, hey, simply being like, I am aware that this is an unhelpful thought. Once you make that decision and identify that, then you could actually start doing something about it, which is to challenge it. Not all thoughts are true. Just because you have a thought doesn't mean that it is fact. Thought is not fact. And I think that's something you could always try to remind yourself of. Um, and then once you notice that and gotten that far, you could start gently challenging it and starting asking your questions. Like, what would I say to my best friend if this is something she was experiencing? You know, what is a fact here? Like, what is actually evidence here? And what is just my thoughts? You know, sometimes what we say is like, we can't control our thoughts. Um, we could definitely challenge them and, you know, trying to make our negatives into positives. But what we do have control over is how we react to those thoughts. And a way to react to it is kind of rewriting it, you know, coming up with a more realistic, kind, helpful, healthy, balanced thought to get us through. Um, the situation. I know we started off with a very quick, calm, one minute, you know, it wasn't even a breathing exercise. I would just say it was just a reminder to take, take a breath, you know, um, but there's a lot of breathing exercises that you could try and it only takes a few seconds. You don't need any equipment. You could do it no matter where you are. It's particularly helpful in stressful situations but I think um, it's also good to practice it at regular intervals throughout the day, even when you're not feeling stressed, um, because they're not easy. A lot of it is kind of going against our instinctual way of breathing, which is with our lungs and our chest. And this is more of like that belly breathing, um, which I'm sure a lot of you guys have heard about. But if you keep practicing it when the situation arises, you will be able to use it a little bit more better, more a little bit better in those actual uh, stressful situations. Um, the one I like a lot is 478, I feel great. So we could take, again, another 30 seconds to just plant our feet softly on the ground, hands at our side. You could even put our hand on our one hand on your belly if you're gonna wanna watch that hand go up with that belly breathing. But I want you to slowly inhale for four seconds. Hold it for seven. And then slowly breathe out over eight seconds. And here I just wrote 470, I feel great because it's a good way to remember it. Um, even if you can't hold for seven in the middle, that's absolutely fine. The one thing I do want you to remember that's important part is that you're inhaling through your nose, exhaling through your mouth, and you're inhaling for a shorter period of time than your exhalation. So you're trying, even if it's by a couple of seconds, you know, holding that exhalation a little bit longer than how long you're taking to do that inhalation. I also put on here progressive muscle relaxation. Um, a lot of times when we're feeling anxious, we're carrying a lot of tension in our bodies. Um, I've actually done this activity for individuals that when we're meeting in person with like tennis balls um, and just taking a tennis ball and putting it under the soles of your feet and just rubbing it back and forth, like kind of as if you're just gliding the ball back and forth and you, and then stopping after like maybe 30 seconds to a minute, whatever. And you like realize the difference between the one foot that did the tennis ball compared to the other and how relaxed you feel in one. A lot of progressive muscle relaxation videos can be found on YouTube. Again, hundreds and hundreds of videos. Try to find ones that are meet your time requirement and how much time you have to put into this. It could be as little as 30 seconds to like 20, 30 minutes, 40 minutes. Um, and what works for your body because everyone has different physical limitations as well. Another one I like to review really quickly are grounding techniques. I think I talked to you about something earlier where you where anxiety can get so bad where you have these episodes of derealization, depersonalization. You're not really grounded to the current moment um, because your anxiety is just taking you somewhere where you're not really there. Um, so this is where you could take, again, don't need any equipment no matter where you are. Just look around, look for five things that you could see. 
and identifying and really looking at it, you know, cat, what is it like, you know, what is the shape? How big is it? What is the texture? Um, is it casting a shadow? You know, things that you could touch again, adding to that texture, um, things that you could hear really listening. A lot of times we're not paying attention to all the sounds going on around us. You know, it could literally just be the rumbling of traffic or birds chirping, or even like the, the air vents going off and you start focusing on it, it helps kind of ground you a little bit to what's going on. Um, things you could smell. And then one, one thing that you could uh, taste. And again, this is one of many grounding techniques. I know one that we talked about earlier, I mentioned briefly was rewriting your thoughts. Um, this is something where you could also do writing, you know, if you're feeling really anxious and you just want to create, kind of ground yourself back to the present moment, you just be like, I'm Vanessa Patel. It's 8.01 on a Thursday evening, April 27, 2023. It, the sun has just set outside. I'm sitting by the window. I see cars going by. I see lights flashing with the construction happening. Again, everything you see, touch, hear, can taste and possibly smell, just writing it all down as if you're, it's in a journal entry. And then what I really like is this personal rescue box. Um, you know, having that handy box or a basket, filling it with things that bring you a sense of joy or calm, um, whether it be things you could look at, you know, old photo albums, books you could read, magazines, things you could um, uh, feel like lotion, a sense of smell, as well as a sense of touch. And like having that, you know, ready and handy, because when your anxiety is peaking, sometimes it's hard to figure out what to do but if you have it there you could just kind of grab it dive into it about for about 15 20 minutes and then kind of help you reset a little bit so you could go back to whatever you were doing before that anxiety started peaking out of nowhere okay um this is our last one which is using the apple technique you know acknowledging that there's some uncertainty on your mind taking a pause not reacting i think just giving that brain a little bit of a time to think before you react Pulling yourself back, you know, kind of telling yourself like this is your anxiety or your depression talking, you know, you can't believe everything you think thoughts are not fact, letting go of that feeling and then exploring the present moment similar to how we just did with grounding um, before you proceed to whatever again you were doing before that anxiety picked up. Um, I'm going to end with just this last thing real quickly, but this is a list of positive affirmations. I actually have this on my clinic wall. Um, because a lot of times we say like, okay, I want to be more in control over my anxiety. I want to be fit. I want to be toned. I want to be healthy. You know, in order to be something, you got to do something about it. And in order to do something about it, you really got to start thinking differently about it. And that's where a lot of our cognitive behavioral therapy is, right? Like the thoughts have so much power and control over us, um, especially the negative ones that have to challenge them with the positive ones. So this is a list of positive affirmations, which I think all of us could benefit from as a reminder that, hey, I'm enough. I'm doing the best I can. I believe in myself. I can improve. I am learning. I am, you know, breathing in confidence. I'm exhaling my fears. I am kind. I am going to fill my mind with positive thoughts. Um, see, like, just read all of them, you know, whenever you get a chance. Um, pick out three. Write the same three on three different index cards. Uh, and put each index card at a spot that you will in, you know, definitely cross at one point in your day, you know, maybe by your toothbrush or your nightstand, your steering wheel, if you drive to work every single day. Um, and every time you cross this index card, just read those three out loud to yourself. And you'll be amazed by like doing this on repeat for several weeks, three positive affirmations, three times a day for three weeks, um, how you start noticing your confidence coming out to then start conquering your anxiety um, and your stress. And then um, this is the children's book that I wanted to kind of share with you guys. Uh, my husband and I wrote during the pandemic. It's called In My Box. It is a conflict of interest that I think I shared on the earlier screen, but all the proceeds for this book do go to mental health research and resources for teens and um, students in the community. In the Delaware community. I think last year we were able to donate to attack, attack addiction, which helps with individuals struggling with substance abuse. Um, but again, it's kind of taking that concept of that personal box, personal rescue box, and giving you an ability to create your joy. Um, so you're not relying on unhealthy um, behaviors like smoking, drinking, bullying, 
to uh, address your anxiety or your nerves. All right, so remember, um, there's a lot of good that comes with anxiety, um, but when we kind of start crossing into the more dangerous side and we start noticing that it's interfering with our day-to-day, -day, you know, you really want to start putting yourself back in the driver's seat. And I feel like a lot of what we talked about today is just the beginning of what is a lot of what you could continue to keep learning. And don't be afraid to reach out for help because it is definitely there. And um, I'm definitely glad to be helping serve this community when it comes to mental health needs, especially anxiety, because like I said, it's inevitable. We all experience it. Um, try to catch it early. And when you do catch it, don't be afraid to reach out for help. Right. So I know that was a lot. Um, any questions? I have a question for you before we start getting to everybody else's. And maybe you already kind of said this, but could you just go over really quick how you got to where you are today? Why you decided to do what you're doing? That kind of stuff. Did you already do that? I know you did it for me, but I can't remember if you did it. Um, so I did talk about um, how I was always interested in like the mind and how it works, because it's like if the brain in general, it's something that if you don't really preserve it with all these chemicals, it's really just mush. And I really was just so fascinated by like how it still has so much power over our day to day and, um, you know, our future. So like in studying about the brain, I was kind of between neurology and psychiatry for a while. Again, you know, very similar, but also so different, you know, uh, and I did a lot of rotations in both those fields while I was in medical school. And I was just, I think I like psychiatry in that it's something that we all struggle with. You know, it's not just a diagnosis or a disorder that can only happen because of a certain event in your life, like a clot to your brain or a heart attack or anything like that. Like everyone has a psychological side to them. Um, it's like, you know, so it's, I, I just feel like it's everywhere. And I was just so interested in working in a field that is so impactful to everyone day to day and not necessarily having to go to a point where you have to be diagnosed with something to be actually doing something about it. Cool. Cool. All right. So we have some questions. Um, how do you know when to prescribe medication for anxiety? So when you are starting to notice that it is interfering with your day to day, um, I usually would recommend starting with a low dose medication. Um, and you could talk to your, uh, primary care provider or psychiatrist about this. Um, they will do a full evaluation. Um, if the thing is like, these skills are great and I am a prescriber by def, like, you know, by licensure and all that, but I do believe in skills over pills a lot, but skill, the pills do have a place in that. Like I mentioned with that quote, it, it serves as a bridge to get you to the other side. You know, if you're not able to, um, get to a point with the help of medications to even start applying these skills, it's really hard to overcome this anxiety. But once you start apply, once you are with the help of medications, you might start able to apply these skills, and they they become part of your ha habitual day to day. Where these skills are actually keeping that anxiety at bay, we could start shaving off the medication and to see how you do. But so it, the combination has proven to be the strongest when it comes to how effective it could be when overcoming your anxiety. Next question is: Does the brain know that you're having stress? The brain knows that there is stress, but they cannot differentiate between the stress that you would get from an actual danger or a thought of possible danger. So it's not able to triage that or like tell the difference. And that's why it just overshoots and overfires and you go into this hyper anxiety mode as if you're ready to fight a bear or run away from a lion, you know, when in reality there's nothing going on, but there's a thought that is taking the place of that danger. Sure, sure. When you were talking about the medications that you could use to treat anxiety, somebody in the chat asked, what about Xanax for anxiety as opposed to these listed? And then thus ensued a little uh, little conversation in the chat. But do you maybe want to talk about anxiety and its use in, uh, no, Xanax and its use in anxiety treatment? Absolutely. So I think I uh, mentioned a few medications. Um, of course, it's not an exhaustive list because I think that would be a whole nother lecture too. But Xanax is under that same category of sedatives with like clonopin and, and uh, Valium or Ativan, which I think I did throw a few of those on, on there. Um, medications for anxiety, yes, but they're not for long-term long treatment for anxiety. So 
basically I like what I like the way I like to explain it is the medications that are actually there for anxiety that you could take long term, which is like Prozac, Zoloft, Lexapro. Um, other names for that would be like fluoxetine, sertraline, escitalopram. So the, our goal, goal is like when our, we have our anxiety that goes like this all day, you know, or like when, especially when you're struggling with a disorder. Um, our goal with those medications, the ones that I mentioned that are more long term, would be to get it to like an even keel. The problem with anxiety uh, with Xanax, Ativan, and Clonopin and all that is that if your anxiety peaks, you take the medication, it brings it back down, it peaks up again, you take the medication, it brings back down, and you're still in this cycle. So it's still exhausting. You're still fighting that boulder like that's been running down the hill a little bit. Um, it becomes a band-aid situation. It doesn't get to the root of the problem, which is like the anxiety and like what's happening at a molecular level to keep that anxiety um, from, from peaking. A lot of times I also like to share that it does have an addictive factor. Um, so after a while, like if you take a Xanax every single day, eventually that one Xanax is not going to be enough. You're going to need two or three, you know, over time, if you are going to take it long-term. So your body does become tolerant of it. And then it doesn't, it does, it's not as effective. So then it demands more. Okay. Um, there's a question. Does electroconvulsive therapy work or is that just movie stuff? Electroconvulsive therapy works. It's more for like depression um, and or mood symptoms uh, more than anxiety, but it's, it's not what it is on the movies. I know they call it like shock therapy and stuff. Um, usually when it's done in the hospital setting, you're pretty much put to sleep with anesthesia with it. So it's, you don't really see the physical shock in the body. It's just happening in the brain when they do the therapy. Are body dysmorphia or eating disorders considered anxiety disorders? Uh, no, they come in from a different category. of So eating disorders is its own category because under eating disorders, there's several different types like anorexia, bulimia, binge eating, um, and they all have their own specifiers. Um, but, uh, body dysmorphia can be can cause anxiety, but it also falls in a different category uh, along with other disorders um, that they share some commonalities with. So there's a question in the chat. Um, it's kind of a situational question. When this person's at a work meeting, they feel anxiety because they feel like everyone around them is smarter than them and looking down on them. What does that mean? That is social anxiety. It is a type, uh, um, it's a situation where, you know, you feel like all eyes are on you, you're going to do something or say something that's not going to be as smart as the person sitting next to you. Um, and I feel like, so A, great for showing up for that meeting. You know, that's again, half the battle, right? You're showing up and now you're at least uh, um, acknowledging like, this is something I'm feeling. Here, I want you to start asking yourself, like, what's the evidence for this? Has there been situations where someone has made a comment or remark around your intellectual level compared to your colleagues? You know, because chances are a lot of it are these your, are your thoughts and they're not fact. So always try to look for that evidence. And if there is a situation because, you know, they are toxic work environments and, you know, if you feel like this is something that people are making you feel um, because of some certain comments or remarks they have made, I think that's that requires another conversation with your boss and your colleagues. But I think the first, where we've gotten so far with this question, I think with the first, next step would be like, show me the evidence. You know, is this something that is my thought versus fact? Can how your parents behave affect your own anxiety? Is it genetic or is it passed down in any way? Yes, um, it is not fully genetic, but genetics can contribute to your anxiety. Um, and a lot of times how your parents react to their anxiety and how they're coping with it, because you're growing up around it. And we all know like um, a lot of kids learn from their parents because they're like their first sight to the rest of the world. So there's a lot of modeling in their behavior. So how how parents respond to their anxiety definitely reflects in kids, um, how and just the genetic buildup definitely has a, a, a percentage of what contributes to your anxiety, but it's not all of it. Can anxiety lead to a heart attack? Anxiety can lead to medical conditions. I think I mentioned that earlier, such as coronary, heart, art, coronary artery disease, which can 
eventually lead to that. But anxiety itself is, it, it would be like a domino effect that eventually leads to it, but it's not like anxiety equals heart attack. Are electroencephalograms or um, brain scans used to diagnose anxiety disorders? No, unfortunately not. Um, we don't have a stethoscope that we could put to your brain to see how it's functioning and circuiting. Um, like I said, it's just mush up there um, otherwise. So that's why you do have to go through these long evaluations. Psychiatric evaluations are quite you know, thorough, like an hour easily, hour and a half. Um, just to kind of understand your your behaviors, your patterns, and how you react to your day to day situations, um, and if that's not enough, they could go even further with like neuropsych testing, which would then dive into a whole series of um, assessments that you could do. That would be like three four hours long to then show if it's really like if your performance is really due to anxiety or lack of performance is due to anxiety. Is there a scale for diagnosing anxiety? Like, is it a, a spectrum or um so there's a scale there um it's called the GAD7 uh it's more of like a screening and it's used for monitoring i wouldn't say it would be just enough to diagnose because again i think we do need to have that that the verbal like evaluation and assessment to determine how much this is impacting your day to day and so there is uh, on that scale i think it's worse at a total of 21 points and depending on like, you know, how you're scoring, like five is mild, 10 is moderate, above 15 would be severe. And then that would determine like, do we want to just target this with therapy alone? Do we need medications and therapy? Um, depending on that spectrum. So and that's a good segue. There's a question in the Q&A. It says therapy versus medication. Which battle do you conquer first? Um, it really depends. Um, it, it's case by case like there's a lot of research that shows that the combination has the best efficacy for long-term maintenance, but it's really on your comfort level. It's not very un, uh, unusual to see individuals who struggle with anxiety to be anxious about even taking a medication to help with their anxiety. So sometimes if we have to start off with therapy first and then see like, okay, you know, I'm doing okay, or no, I'm still struggling. Maybe I do need that medication, um, but it's really it's case by case. I can't really say if it needs to be one or the other for anyone, unless you actually go and get evaluated to see where you're falling and how severe it is. What can be done by people who don't have anxiety or dis anxiety disorders to help those that do? Like there are several questions about specifically somebody with social anxiety or somebody with bipolar. How can you help other people? So I think talking to them a, is a huge step one, like letting them know that, hey, I'm here. Because a lot of times people who struggle with mental health illnesses, whether it be anxiety disorders or other, um, often feel isolated. They feel like people don't understand. Um, so I think talking to them, kind of letting them know that you're there and you know, you're there to support them in whatever they need. If they're struggling to seek help, maybe like offering to go for that first appointment um, or helping them make that first appointment for them with a behavioral health specialist or even their primary care doctor to be like, hey, I'll be there. If, like, I'll just be there in the waiting room if you need to tag me. And like, just again, being present um, can be helpful. Um, when it comes to like your loved ones and your individuals that you know in your household that are actually been diagnosed with it, like I said, um, when we were reviewing skills, there's no side effects to a lot of these skills that help with anxiety. Work on them together, you know, be a part of that treatment for them. Of course, don't make it so much that like they can't use these skills without you because then that again becomes an unsafe, um, like uh, like unhealthy safety behavior, but like kind of just kind of getting help, getting the ball, ball rolling with utilizing a lot of these skills because we could all benefit from them. We don't have to have a disorder to um, ground ourselves every once in a while. Very true. Um, if you are a minor and your parents don't support therapy, but you believe it would be beneficial for you, what are your options? So I think you could still talk to your primary care doctor about it. Um, and then if they feel like this is not safe for you to, if, if they feel like your parents are keeping like you know, keeping you in an unsafe situation by having this untreated anxiety for so long and it could be detrimental to your emotional and physical health, then they would be able to tag in some legalities to make sure that that is being addressed. Okay. 
Um, what do you recommend for people who have anxiety or are anxious about an upcoming event and can't get a good night's sleep? <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch that. What do you recommend for people who have anxiety or are anxious about an upcoming event and can't get a good night's sleep? I'm laughing because this was me yesterday. <laughs> um, so I think a lot of anxiety can be addressed with good sleep hygiene. And I know that could be a whole nother lecture too. Um, but really like maybe uh, if, if you're noting that like it's, if it's worrying about the next day or like an event that's coming up, like making a checklist and like, remember, like, again, showing you, yourself the evidence, like I've done all this, it's like I've done what I can, like I've done what I can have control over and I have to start letting go of the things I may not have control over, right? So again, kind of reassuring your brain and giving it that positive feedback that like I did whatever I had to do, I'm as prepared as I can be, and then using good sleep hygiene. So not like doom scrolling on your phone, you know, while you're trying to go to sleep and like trying to like rule out every hypothetical situation that possibly can go wrong at that event um doing things that are relaxing the night before like you know taking a shower you know listening to some calm music before kind of getting into bed um reading a book or something like that or something again whatever works for you to help calm your nerves before you go get into bed and again no, noting that like it's not abnormal if you're express experiencing this but if it's happening all the time and there is no trigger, like in this situation, there is a stressful event that's coming up, right? So it's, to some degree, it's normal. But then when it gets to a point where it's not, it's not allowing you to function the rest of the, the time, that's when we kind of cross into that. Or it's lingering even after this event has passed, you're still experiencing this anxiety of what could have, should have, would have happened. Can anxiety disorders be overcome or are diagnoses lifelong? So anxiety disorder is very often um, lifelong. It, do, it there has a po there is a po like possibility to overcome it. It's not to say that you're going to have to be on medications your whole life, but because you, like I said, a lot of this starts in childhood, and your your brain is hardwired to respond to danger in a certain way or lack of danger even in a certain way. Those you really need to start kind of working on using those positive thoughts more and like not really falling into the negative thought traps and challenging them, challenging your automatic thoughts. And if you keep doing it enough, like you will overcome it. But that's not to say that you won't have a situation down the road because going into adulthood, there's a lot of stressors um, that you might not fall into those old habits, right? So it is gonna be like this, this challenge for you. It will get easier as you keep practicing these skills and you have the help of medications. But I can't really, you can't really say that it's going to go away and never happen again because you're going to face stress and that's inevitable. Is hypochondriasis a type of anxiety? It is anxiety provoking, but it, it comes from that same category of disorders that I think someone asked about earlier with body dysmorphia. So it's clustered with another group of disorders. Okay. Um, you mentioned happy gut, happy brain. How are these related? So diet and uh, I always say diet and exercise are just so crucial to our mental and physical health, well-being. Um, I think we could all safely say that when we're overstuffed or eating really bad, you know, fried, very high carb foods, like we don't feel so great. Sometimes we feel bloated, we feel groggy. We, we say like we got that food coma. You're going to just like, like curl, curl, you know, like go to bed. So again, it interferes with our, the best, of, the better side of us, you know, being able to put that best foot forward when we're facing a stressful situation or a day-to-day, -day, um, you know, hustle and bustle kind of thing. So in general, a happy gut, like just to have a good, healthy diet can help our brains in that we're giving it the right nutrition to function well. If you are having an anxiety attack and you cannot calm down, what would happen? Nothing. <laughs> and that is the beauty of a panic attack. Even if you do absolutely nothing, you don't take a medication, you don't do any of your deep breathing exercises, the beauty of a panic attack is that it has to come down. It's just that until it comes down, it just feels so horrible that that's why we have these skills that we can use to bring it down a little bit more smoother, a little bit more sooner. 
Can a diagnosis of anxiety lead to discoveries of other psych conditions like schizophrenia or bipolar disorder or depression? Yes. Yes. Um, when, when you're being evaluated, um, even if you go in saying like, Hey, I'm worried that I might have anxiety. When you get a full psychiatric, psychiatric evaluation, they are going to go through a whole gamut of symptoms with you to see if there's any comorbid symptom, uh, diagnoses, like the few that you mentioned along with others. All right. Let's call this the last question. How would doctors or psychiatrists know if a patient has a chemical imbalance that causes a psychological disorder? That's a really great question. Oh, all the questions have been really great, by the way. Um, but I was like, I feel like I'm in the hot spot, like the hot seat. <laughs> I know. I'm like, boom, 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 <laughs> boom, boom, boom. Um, but uh, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the question. How are how will doctors know that yeah. you have a chemical imbalance? So uh, the thing that's a really great question because a lot of times when we assess for anxiety, we said that in a lot of the lecture today, that if there is an identifiable stress or stressor or a cause for that fear, that danger, that uneasiness, that nervousness that becomes situational um, versus chemical. Usually when there is no identifiable trigger or stress or anything to be really like that nervous about to that, you know, unreasonable, irrational fear or, or worry. Um, that's when we know that the chemical imbalance is playing a role in that presentation. And um, if it is truly situational, um, a lot of times medications won't be offered because we are going to address that with therapy and how to navigate that situation. But if it has some component of chemical um, imbalance, that's when the combination will work better. Thank you so much, Dr. Patel. I know I learned a lot, uh, even if it's just how to breathe properly. Um, I hope everybody enjoyed this evening's session. Uh, as always, Dr. Patel's slides will be available on DelawareMiniMed.org. Um, Matt did put in the survey one more time, so please do make sure that you've filled out that survey to check your attendance. Um, please fill it out by nine o'clock. If you are joining us on the phone, please just give me an email real quick and let me know that you attended. Um, Next week, our fifth session on May 4th is going to be about neurointerventional surgery with Dr. Siva Patham. I hope I pronounced that right. I'll have to check with him. Um, but thank you so much, everybody. And um, we'll see you next week. Thank you, Dr. Patel. We enjoyed it. Thank you, guys. Good night. You guys were great.